Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Andrew. I'm an assistant pastor here at King's. And today I'm continuing our series called Following Jesus. We're talking about what does it mean, what does it look like to live as a follower of Jesus. And today in particular, we're going to look in at one of what I think is an overlooked element of being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus. We're going to talk about being an expectant disciple, someone living in ever readiness for the return of Jesus. Because the New Testament is really clear that one day Jesus will come back. In the same way he ascended to be with God the Father, one day he will descend to earth. At that point he will judge all people and his people will be taken off into a new creation to live in perfect eternity with him forever and forever. That's the Christian hope that the gospel gives us. But the New Testament is also really clear that we don't know when that's going to happen. We know Jesus is coming back but we don't know when he's going to come back. And that fact, what we know there about the future, is meant to affect how we live now in the present. And I was reflecting as I was thinking about this this week, is there something in our own lives that might help us to get that idea of we know something's happening, we don't know when, and you need to live in ever readiness? And I think there is. One that many of us may be aware of, that parallel experience is awaiting the imminent arrival of an online delivery or an online purchase. I don't know you, but for me in my household, this seems to be quite a regular occurrence. You know the delivery is coming, you don't know quite when it's coming, and therefore you have to live in ever readiness. In my household, that means ascertaining who's going to be in at different times, who needs to have the little portable doorbell thing. And when I'm, as it were, on duty to take, uh, take a arrival of the deliveries, I'm kind of a bit paranoid and it affects the way I live. I, I'm paranoid about, you know, having a nap if it's my day off or being in the bathroom or something when the delivery comes and not being ready. Knowing it's going to happen, but not knowing when, affects how we live. Well, that's kind of what's going to happen with the return of Jesus. We know he's coming, we don't know when, therefore we need to live in ever readiness. And this is actually what Jesus himself says in Matthew 24 and 25, we're going to look this morning. Matthew is one of the accounts of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection in the New Testament in the Bible. And these two chapters are mostly a long section of Jesus' teaching in answer to a question the disciples ask. Because you see, during the day, Jesus and his disciples have been in the temple, this amazing complex of buildings in Jerusalem where they were for uh, Passover. And the disciples have pointed out, Jesus, look at these amazing buildings. And Jesus has told them, actually, every last bit of these are going to be taken down to the ground. They're going to be destroyed. A little bit later, they're sitting on a hill looking at these buildings, and the disciples ask Jesus a question. They say, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age? And really all of Matthew 24 and 25 is an answer to those questions. And the reason we get a bit confused in these chapters is there's three things in that question. They're asking about the temple destruction, about the return of Jesus, and about what they call the end of the age, the coming of a new creation. And the main chunk of chapter 24, after that question, is a whole load of things that Jesus says is going to happen natural disasters, uh, people claiming to be the Messiah, wars, this thing called the abomination of desolation. And for us, it raised all these kind of questions of, well, what are these things? When are they going to happen? Are they about the temple or about Jesus coming back? Have they happened or are we still waiting? And actually, we're not going to look at that in any detail today, partly because for the application we're going to look at, it actually doesn't matter exactly how you understand that. But if you do want to look into that more, as it happens, I preached on that a few years ago in our Matthew series. You can go on the website, look for the Matthew series, a preach called Be Ready, which will also take an e-news and a social media this week, which gives you more of an overview of that chapter 24. But today we're going to pick up on when Jesus applies the truth and how he tells us to live in light of that. I'm going to pick up in verse 36 of Matthew 24. Jesus now is talking about his return to earth, and he says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus here makes one thing very clear right up front. Nobody knows when he's going to return. Not even the angels, not even he in his human nature knows when he's going to return. Only God the Father. And that is so important to hear and to get. Do you notice the disciples asked when? And actually many people since have asked that question, when is this going to happen? And many people claim to know when it's going to happen, even though Jesus says no one knows when it's going to happen. 
Even today, people look around the world, they look at this kind of worldwide pandemic, this disaster we're living through, and they say, this is a surefire sign. Jesus is just about to come back. Jesus says no one knows. Nobody knows. This simple verse reminds us that any time someone tells us they know when Jesus is going to come back, we can know they don't know. Because even Jesus doesn't know, and he's told us no one knows when he is coming back. It's also actually really helpful in reading the Bible. It helps us to understand different bits of the Bible. If no one knows when Jesus is coming back, even Jesus doesn't know, then the Bible is not trying to give us some coded, hidden message to work out the day and time that Jesus is going to come back. Sometimes that's how people read parts of the Bible, but Jesus makes it really clear here. That's not what it's about. It's not the aim. We don't know. We can't know when he's coming back. Any reading of the Bible that claims to tell you when Jesus is coming back is a misreading of the Bible because Jesus says right here that no one knows. It's a misunderstanding of what the Bible says about the future and the return of Jesus. And we haven't got time to go into that big topic today, but I thought I'd recommend to you a little booklet I found really helpful on this topic. You can see how slim it is, a very kind of accessible, quick read. It's called Kingdom, Hope, and the End of the World, The Now and Not Yet of Eschatology. It's by a guy called Ian Paul, who is an Anglican minister and a New Testament scholar. And it's just a really helpful, very kind of bite-sized, accessible introduction to the Bible's teaching about the future and the return of Jesus and the new creation. And I really recommend it to you. This is a way to get a bit of a level-headed understanding of those things. But for us today, the key thing is Jesus' key point here is really clear. No one knows when he's coming back. We know what will happen, but we don't know when. And Jesus then illustrates that and then draws a conclusion. Verse 42, therefore, because I'm coming back, because no one knows when I'm coming back, therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Jesus says because he's coming back, and because we don't know when, we need to be awake. We need to be ready. We need to live in ever readiness for that moment. He gives an illustration. He says, imagine you knew a thief was coming to your house, but you didn't know when. You would stay awake all night just to be on your guard, ready for that moment to protect your house, to protect your family. In the same way, he's saying, be ready. We, as followers of Jesus, are to be expectant disciples, expecting, anticipating that day and living ever ready, awake and ready for that moment. And of course, that raises for us the question of, well, what does that mean? What does it look like? How do you live awake and ready? Presumably, it doesn't mean literally being awake all the time because none of us can do that. How do we live ready for Jesus' return? And Jesus knew we'd ask that question. And so the rest of chapter 24 into 25 of Matthew give us four uh, parables or blocks of teaching explaining what it looks like to actually live in readiness. We're just going to pick up on two of those today to get a bit of an understanding of how we're to live. The first one is the parable, the little story of the wise and the wicked servants. And this is kind of all about what attitude we should have as those living, waiting for the return of Jesus, how we should live in action as we do that. Let's just read it from verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect it. And at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The scenario here is a master of a large household goes off for an unspecified amount of time and places a senior servant in charge, particularly to care for the others, to give them their food. And Jesus says there's a faithful way and a wise way of doing this or a wicked way of doing this and responding to this. The wise and faithful example, he fulfills his role. 
He cares for the people. His attitude, basically, is to continue in service as if his master was still there in person. He lives, he does his duty, or performs his duty as if his master had never gone away and he was actually still there. But the wicked servant takes advantage of his master's absence, thinking, well, he's not here. He'll never know. What does it matter? I can do what I want. It's not going to matter. And so rather than uh, fulfilling his duty to care for others, he starts beating them and abusing them. Rather than acting as if his master was still there, actually he starts indulging his own desires and eating and drinking with drunkards. And so when the master returns at an unexpected time, he's coming, we don't know when, he suddenly appears, the wise and faithful servant is praised, but the wicked servant is judged and punished. The challenge to us here is to live in ever readiness by living as if Jesus was still with us in person and living as if our master was right here, living in obedience to our master, as faithful as we would to a master who is present as we do to a master who is absent. We're to be those who are caring for others. We're to be those who are mastering our own desires, not being mastered by them, but mastering them. As we wait for the return of Jesus, it's easy to think of our sin, of our rebellion about, against God. Oh, it doesn't really matter. To think, oh, it's only a small thing. Or, you know, Jesus isn't here yet. It doesn't matter at the moment. That can kind of stay there for a while. It's easy to think our sin is insignificant or hidden. It just doesn't really matter. We can deal with it later. It's so easy to allow ourselves to follow and to be mastered by sinful desires rather than to live in line with our master's direction. But Jesus is saying here, that's not the way to live in ever readiness. He's actually saying here, we won't get away with that. To live in ever readiness is to deal radically with the sin that remains in our lives. To live in obedience to him as if he was right here in person with us. Living in readiness for the return of Jesus means being obedient to him, even in his in-person absence from us. That's the first little bit of teaching Jesus gives us on how we live in ever readiness. And then the second one, the next one we'll look at, is what's often called the parable of the ten virgins, or we might better understand it as bridesmaids and kind of our way of thinking of things. Here's what he says. This is now chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This little story is built on the wedding customs of the time of Jesus, which were a bit different to our day and age. In our day and age, a wedding is a very particular time, and you make sure that you're there on time. Weddings are pretty much the only time in life that I'm always on time. I want to be in time to things to life, I'm just not very good at. Weddings, I will always be there, or thus far, I've always been there on time. You know the time and you turn up. That's not actually how it works in Jesus' day. Weddings were a long, drawn-out affair of multiple days in Jesus' day. And it started with the bridegroom coming to the house of the bride to take her away to the wedding ceremony at an unspecified time. You'd be waiting around, waiting for when is the bridegroom going to come, not really knowing. And so you had to live in readiness for that moment. And these young women, these bridesmaids, are there to greet the groom when he comes. And they've got these lamps of oil to burn in case he comes at night. The wise have taken with them spare oil. They are prepared for any eventuality, however long he takes, whether it's day or night. But the foolish take their lamps, but they don't take any additional supplies of oil. They're there, but they are unprepared for the eventuality that might actually happen. The simple point Jesus is making here is we need to be prepared for his return in the way the wise bridesmaids were prepared for that point. Because the groom arrives unexpectedly, 
The wise have got the oil they need, but the foolish haven't. And it transpires the foolish can't just borrow uh, more oil from the wise. They have to go, on a, go off and get their own, but by the time they come back, it's too late. There comes a point where it's too late to prepare. You've got to prepare in advance. So, of course, the question becomes, so what does it look like to be prepared for the return of Jesus? And I think the clue, actually, is in the final verse of that little story we read, where the story about the groom and the bridesmaids bridesmaid kind of begins to morph into the story of Jesus' return, where this Lord, an ambiguous figure, Jesus in this story now, responds to the foolish, truly I say to you, I do not know you. The issue isn't really about oil. We're not meant to ask, what is the oil? The issue is... Do you know him? Or does Jesus know you? The issue is, are we in personal relationship with Jesus? And this gospel in the New Testament and the rest of the New Testament will make clear that to be known by Jesus means to come into relationship with him through repentance. That means turning away from an old life of rebelling against him and through faith, which is trusting in his promise to save and accept us and welcome us into life with him. That's how we prepare. We make sure we are prepared for the return of Jesus. We come into relationship with him through repentance, turning away, and faith, turning to him. But notice also three other quick little things about this story. The bridesmaids seemingly all look to the same. They're all in the same place, likely they've all been wearing kind of the same things, but they weren't all prepared. I think one of the things Jesus is trying to uh, hint us or to us in this story is you can look like you're prepared and not actually be prepared. You can look like a Christian and not actually have truly responded to Jesus. The challenge to us here is are we actually prepared? Have we personally, individually repented and trusted in Jesus? Notice also these foolish bridesmaids wanted to borrow. When the uh, bridegroom comes, they think, oh, we'll borrow some from someone else. We'll be okay. They've got some. We'll borrow from them. Uh, but it turns out they couldn't do that. There are some things that just can't be borrowed. You can't borrow the response of and the relationship with Jesus that your friend or your parent or your spouse has. This has to be something we do, a choice we make as individuals. Again, the challenge to us is have we personally, individually responded in repentance and faith to Jesus. And also notice the bridesmaids try to get oil. When they realize their need, they go off, they try to get the oil, but by the time they come back, it's too late. It was too late for them to prepare. Friends, there does come a point where it's too late for us to respond and to prepare for the return of Jesus. One of the things Jesus is saying to us here is don't keep putting it off. Don't think, oh yeah, I'll do that later. Well, that's not important at the moment. No, at any time the bridegroom could come back. At that point, it will be too late to respond. Jesus' challenge to us is have we actually personally now responded in repentance and faith to him? This is a really stark warning, actually. The return of Jesus, or Jesus is returning, and we need to repair, prepare in repentance and in faith. The time to do that is right now. We as individuals have to do that. May the band could head back up at this point, please. So we as followers of Jesus, we're meant to live as expectant disciples, ever ready for the return of Jesus, knowing one day he will come back, but we don't actually know when that will be. I love the way that Michael Green, who's a commentator on this passage, puts it. He says, Jesus did not tell us to get out our calculators and polish our crystal balls but to live a holy life in preparation for meeting him. We get ready for the return of Jesus, not by working out when's it going to happen, but by knowing it's going to happen. Now let's live holy lives in response. The challenge to us today now is quite obvious. Are we living in ever readiness for the return of Jesus? Have we responded to the challenge of the parable of the ten bridesmaids? Have we made a personal choice to follow Jesus, repenting from an old life, turning to trusting him. Friend, let me encourage you this morning, don't put that off. If you haven't done that, you can do that even today. You can do it in your own heart as we're responding a moment and then grab someone at the end and talk to someone and find out more. And have we heard the challenge of the faithful and the wicked servants? So we living in obedience to Jesus right now, even though he's not with us in an embodied, personal, in-person way. Are we living in obedience to our master 
because obedience really, really matters. Our response to this really is to go away and to live this. This is more of a kind of Monday through to next Sunday kind of response job, but we're going to take a moment just to worship together, just to pause to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us about our personal response. How is it that we need to respond to this in the way we live our lives? What does it look like for us as individuals to live in ever readiness to Jesus? So why don't we just stand and engage with God? I'm going to pray to invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us, to challenge us where we need that, to help us know how to live this out. And the band will leave us, lead us and let's give us a chance to do that. Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful truth that one day Jesus will return. Every eye will see him and that he will take with him all of his people into a glorious new creation, eternity with you. And Lord God, we know that day is coming We know we don't know when it is coming, and so we want to be people who live in ever readiness for that moment. And Spirit of God, we just invite you here right now and say, would you come and speak to us? Would you come and challenge us when we need to be challenged? Would you come and equip us when we need to be equipped? Would you enable us to live in ever readiness for that wonderful day that is coming? Come, we pray, and move amongst us, speak to us, and help us now, we ask, Holy Spirit. Amen.